Okay. And let's make this live. All right. So welcome everybody. My name is Boyan Fierst. I'm manager of knowledge mobilization at the Leslie Harris Center of Regional Policy and Development at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, I have Michael Johnny from York with me. Uh, I'm going to do some uh, housekeeping items. Feels kind of weird, but uh, I'm sure you all know where your uh, washrooms and emergency exits are, so <laughs> I don't have to tell you that. But um, there are a couple of things that you should know about the interface. Um, you have a chat box in the, on the, on the right-hand side of the screen. Feel free to type questions in there. But a better way to do that is to actually type in a Q&A box. Right now, that box is at the bottom of your screen. Um, but when we start sharing the presentation screen, it will be on the top of your screen. And it says Q&A, as you would expect. Um, when you type a question there, we'll see it and we'll be able to uh, answer it and get it, um, and close it once it's answered. Uh, we have a couple of short presentations, but we're really hoping that this will be a little bit more of a discussion and a little bit less of a presentation. Um, we have 22 participants right now. It's 1.30, so did you want to take it, Michael? Yeah, I think we're all set to go. Thank you very much, Boyan, and also thank you to Michael uh, and Brandon for getting us set up. Oh, I should have mentioned that. I'm sorry, Go Michael. Uh, Michael Baderwick uh, from Brandon University and the um, Rural Development Institute at Brandon uh, has, uh, has been working with Rural Policy Learning Commons uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council funded partnership and they very graciously provided us with this lovely tool. Um, that um, I really enjoy using because it seems to have the best connection and the easiest interface. So we'll take it from here. I'm just going to move our <laughs> camera somewhere there so that it's not far away. Great. And Michael. All right. Thank you very much. I'm very excited about this. Uh, the Research Impact Canada Network is over 10 years old, and this is our very first webinar. So I uh, hope everyone enjoys it. The objectives around our presentations are, are more introductory. Uh, I don't think anybody is going to be leaving here with the full suite of knowledge and information around how to develop any clear language writing products, but we wanted to be able to introduce two separate things that we're doing, both at York University and at Memorial, uh, with ongoing opportunity to share and exchange information around how to do that. Uh, just that should do the trick. No? Hmm. Oh, so just click. Okay. So I'm going to be talking for about 15 minutes, um, go over some assumptions which kind of drove uh, our work at York, and then I'm really going to get into uh, our clear language product, the research snapshot, talking about why we did it, how they're developed, and a little bit of information for yourself around how you might be able to engage in this product in the future. So there are two, two assumptions around this work that I wanted to share. Uh, the first one, I think research in Canada has a greater opportunity to inform policy and practice. I mean, simply, so many of our, our um, colleagues within universities in Canada, and if anybody is joining us from, from Brighton, but probably all around the world, there is the opportunity for that research to have greater utility. Uh, number two, another assumption around communication is, is twofold. There are barriers around accessing academic research. Firstly, and historically, they, they have lived in university libraries where a lot of our non-academic partners may not have act, like physical access to the research. And secondly, the language and the length of a document is such that they're really difficult to access. Uh, Clear language summaries help with this. Ooh, I, went, I went too far, sorry. I love this diagram because I think we've all been in meetings and, and conversations where we're the person on the right. We're saying, oh my God, what are they talking about? I don't understand. And certainly one of our efforts within knowledge mobilization is to expand that understanding space. Uh, in the eight or nine years that we've been working with clear language research summaries, we've gotten some really good feedback that it does support that understanding. This is the product itself. It's or at least the first page of it. Um, 
But if you've looked at any research snapshots that have been developed uh, over the last number of years, they're all going to have a similar look and feel. Um, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, it would be a separate conversation to get into the history of its development, but this work was clearly informed by a number of our researchers and a number of non-academic stakeholders. Um, there are two pages, so there would be a, a um, on the back side, uh, additional information. They all ask some standard questions. We've also published around the development of this work, and there is a, a link which folks can, uh, can access to pull up a paper that speaks to the development of this resource in a lot more detail. But why did we do this? And I think the greatest reason is around access. And I love this picture because I really think there's a correlation between the size of the document and the extent to which it's read. Um, academic journal, journal articles can range from like eight to 30, 40 pages or more. And I think uh, the bigger the document is, the more challenging it is for folks to access it. And what we do, we take the integrity of a journal article or a conference paper and distill it into a two page summary. Understanding we haven't invented a darn thing. There are many of these that, that are out there, but we've created one that works really well for our network for our researchers and a lot of our external stakeholders. So how are they developed? I mean, the, the one question we get is like, whoa, my goodness, how do, you get your, how do you get your researchers to write these? Well, we don't. As part of a service unit, we train students and pay them to do this kind of work. What we will ask from our researchers is that they forward papers along to us and we have students write them. The students are trained. We bring in an adult educator to provide some dedicated training and he goes through a, a complex six step process. His events range from one hour to about a half day hands on. And you're gonna you know, be excited that I'm giving this to you in a, a very quick 15 minute version. But he's packaged a lot of the training under a broad write for the reader uh, framework, which I think is a great way to look at the purpose of, of, of our research snapshot development because they are well intended for the users to whom we develop them. They're geared toward the general public, but we let our researchers know that they can market them to, to other researchers, as well as other stakeholders like government and organizations. They're like a calling card. They give people an opportunity to learn about the researcher and something that they do that might be important to them. The snapshots follow, as I mentioned earlier, a consistent uh, template and, and format that goes through a series of, of headings. Um, all told, they're about 500 words or so with the so what piece, the, uh, the, the what do you need to know. Um, because I've had folks come up to me, it's like, I don't have time to read the two pager. Well, what's the essence of, of this? Uh, and we have a shaded uh, text box that, that provides that kind of overview. So in closing for myself, how can you engage with this? And I'm speaking uh, predominantly to, to my colleagues uh, within the Research Impact Canada Network. Um, York has actually trademarked a research snapshot. And along with our member institutions, you have full access toward the development and, and uh, marketing of this tool. We've created some style guidelines and a writer's guide. And what we have started to create that we will start to share is the notion of a toolkit, which will break down the developmental process in a lot of detail. So if there are colleagues across the country, it's like, hey, I think we'd really like to get involved we can share that information with you and that will complement any training that would take place. Further, uh, the network has, has mark, marketed this to, to other organizations. We have MOUs with, with nine organizations. To date, we've developed over 400 of these and our partners have developed over 500. We do ongoing sessions uh, at York on campus. We've, our instructor has been working with, with one professor over a number of years and he, he comes in and does a, a guest lecture and, and have the students uh, draft uh, a snapshot. But I have to acknowledge that there are other folks that are doing this exceptionally well. Our, our, our partners at McMaster University in Hamilton have developed research snaps, which are really kind of based on the same concept. 
and they've had a tremendous amount of success with them. Actually, they're an award-winning uh, product. Uh, they received, a, I believe, a communications award from Shirk for, for that work. We have large-scale research projects like the Homeless Hub on campus that have uh, taken the format and ad adapted it for themselves as well. So it is something that we feel there's strong value in and we'd like to be able to share and exchange it with you if there's any interest and just extending the conversation further. But I'll pass things over to Boyan now. Okay. Thank you, Mike. So if we have, we can take a little break from the presentations if you'd like to. And uh, you can, uh, we can answer some questions um, if you would like to do it that way. Or we could, I can just uh, keep talking. Um, so it's up to you, however you want to do it. And while we're waiting, I'm going to share my messy desktop because <laughs> I think I will need Oh. Okay, let's keep talking then. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, oh, Lisa has a great question. How do you track uptake and use of the research snapshots? Lisa, this became a lot easier for us to do when we embedded uh, the dissemination through a social media strategy. Um, what, we, what we did very quickly is uh, tweet out a research snapshot every day. And also given the fact that these were all consolidated within a database, we were able to, to track some rudimentary analytics around the number of views and such. And I know that within that paper I discussed, there was a, about a 270% increase in, in Twitter traffic and, and web hits uh, where, they, where they were all. So from a, and that's the, the numbers. From a qualitative standpoint, to be quite honest, we haven't done a, a fulsome evaluation around this. But working with a number of partners and we get together with them every year, I had asked them if they wanted to collectively do an evaluation around this work. And they're reflecting on it now. We're not at a stage in our collective development where I think they're comfortable moving forward. And we simply might have to do this at York on our own. But thank you. Okay. Um, all right. If there are no, oh, we have one more. This is really nice. Uh, let me see. How has Snapchat been received within the internal academic community? It's been really well received our, for two reasons, Marcelo. I, I think the fact that it is a, a fairly easy service for our researchers, it's a pretty light touch. All they really need to do is forward us one of their, their recent, uh, recent journal articles that has some kind of interface with policy or practice, even if it's sort of recommendations, and we provide them a finished product. They have full ownership and they can sign off on it. So they, they appreciate it from a service standpoint, but I also know that we've got uh, researchers who have appreciated having something that they can take with them. That calling card model has been really strong where they can go to a conference, they can meet with peers, they can share it uh, with community organizations. So it's been really positive. And can we have a couple more questions? How do you engage government agencies who might not use social media? The government, the government agencies and that, that point, Wayne, came about when we did our initial development. So the social media strategy is only one component of it. Um, we use these when we have collaborative events um, with government and with community. We'll print off a series of, of snapshots and, and share them with them. If they're coming to a, an event around affordable housing, there could be anywhere from two to six snapshots that would be made available uh, for them. But we let our researchers know too that you know, they're, they're an important part of this process and that they can help share and exchange that information that way. And we have a question from Krista. Hi, Krista. The existing format is a PDF. What other formats have you considered? And maybe we can both answer this. Uh, 
I know in our experience, we've had a number of different projects who have made them more dynamic. Uh, the snapshot has become like using web 2.0 tools. They'll embed graphics. They'll embed, um, embed video links. It becomes a more dynamic way to in, in, engage and interact. The PDF format is, is fairly static, yet still has, uh, has some value. And remember, we used the format to develop large posters, small posters for the Share Congress. Yep. Yeah, we've used them in all sorts of different ways. Another question from Lisa around assessing the skills development of students working on the snapshots. And Lisa, that probably aligns with our overall evaluation efforts, which is anecdotal. I mean, I, I will certainly uh, connect with the with the instructor and with the students to, to get a, a bit of a feedback loop. Uh, but it's also the kind of thing over time where I'd want to go back to students and get a sense of, like we've had students that have moved on from our office and cited the kind of work they've done in clear, uh, clear language communications being real, uh, very central to their career development. Okay. We have Isabella asking uh, if there have been any concerns from journal publishers regard, regarding this tool and potentially impeding publication of manuscripts. Now, this is a, a test of my memory, Isabella. I don't believe there's been anything explicit. We haven't had any sort of formal uh, pushback. We have had researchers ask if we hold off uh, around adding it to the database until their publication goes live. And in some cases, we've been holding on to it for, for a number of months. We, but the one thing that we, we put on each snapshot is a, a Creative Commons licensing, where it's a, sort of a non-derivative, where it's like, take it, share it, but just attribute it. So to, to really kind of safeguard uh, the researcher's IP around that. And maybe I can answer this question from Memorial's perspective. Here at the Harris Center, one of the things we do is we offer some applied research funding. Uh, when I say applied in our context, that means that researchers have to have a community or an industry or they have to have an outside of university partner in order to be eligible for the funding. Part of that funding process is that at the end, when the project is finished, we require a research summary as well as a uh, report which is not supposed to be an academic report. It's supposed to be a lay report to some extent. Uh, we have, just like Michael, encountered in the past situations where, re where researchers asked us to hold off on the report uh, and the summary. But in most cases, we find that researchers were quite capable of providing us with a report and a summary that did not impact um, the value of their academic publications. Um, the things get a little bit trickier um, if there is an IP, technical IP involved. Um, that becomes a whole other thing and uh, we still have a report on a project that has been finished a year and a half ago that's going through the patent process and you know, hopefully one day we can tell everybody what a great project that was, but at this point we still have to sit on it. Oh, and we have, I think, one more in the chat. Oh, thanks. You're more than welcome. Oh, one more question. Oh, perfect. Um, already, I am. I'll give you. Oh, he really doesn't like going back. All right, let's try this again. So, I am manager of knowledge mobilization at uh, the Lester Harris Center of Regional Policy and Development here at Memorial University of Newfoundland in St. John's. And uh, our center is sort of an outreach arm for the university. We work with every faculty in school um, at the university. We tend to do a little bit less with the Faculty of Medicine because we have very good colleagues at the Newfoundland Labrador Center for Applied Research who do what we do for the rest of the university uh, for the Faculty of Medicine. So we tend to um, bounce projects and ideas um, that come our way that deal with medicine off to that. Uh, what 
I'm going to talk a little bit about is how we use research summaries. Um, they're very similar in many ways to research snapshots, uh, but for technical reasons, we have to make them a little bit different. Um, as many of you know, here at Memorial, we have um, a database connecting tool uh, called yafl.ca. Uh, and I'll show you in a second what that looks like. And uh, Yafu is a Newfoundland word that means an arm load. So arm load of fish, arm load of wood. In our case, we'd like to think of it as arm load of knowledge. It allows researchers to post their profiles and research summaries, and it allows anybody to create a research opportunity. And then my job and my colleague Amy's job is to actually broker the relationships between potential partners and uh, people at the university. Um, so I'm going to click on the link and hopefully this is going to work. I want to show you an example that one of our graduate students that we funded through our um, waste fund, um, a, a research summary that um, she wrote. Oh, that didn't quite work. Um, so this is Yafu. Uh, it allows you to browse projects and opportunities in various ways. I happen to know where this researcher is. So we'll go to oceans, fisheries, and aquaculture, and there is Jacqueline. Um, so this is a really, this is a actually quite scientific project, but she managed to make it into something that reads almost like social science rather than actual hardcore um, biology and chemistry science. Um, essentially, she's part of the lab that's looking at marine plastics, microplastics. She's particularly interested in the amount of plastics that's in the fish gut. Um, in the fish that's used for food, because plastics collect um, all sorts of industrial chemicals uh, and can release them into the, uh, into the flesh of the animals that we eat, such as fish. Um, so this is, uh, when, when we funded her project, she wrote, a research, the researchers have to provide us with a lay summary, and we provide them with some guidance that I'm going to walk you through in a minute, um, how we would like them to do this. Um, she did this on her own, never came to consult us, but um, she did a really nice job of translating what is hard science into something that's um, quite readable and um, very easy for us to use on social media, um, to promote her and her research, but also to share with other communities outside of Fog Island, which is her study area, um, who may be interested in participating in this kind of research. So, so I am going to see if get, it does get me back. That's amazing. So that was a sample summary I wanted to show you. So when we talk to students, and Michael and I just spent the whole morning talking to graduate students who are participating in public scholar program uh, at the School of Graduate Studies here. Uh, we talked to them, and we had some um, hands-on exercises about uh, research summary. It was great. It was really fun, actually. Um, but we asked them to think about why they are writing this particular research summary or research snapshot. Sometimes they're writing it because it's a funding requirement. Whoever gave the money for this research project requires a summary. If that's all you want, think about how much energy you really want to put into it and treat it accordingly. Sometimes they need to meet departmental requirements. For example, at Memorial, there are departments such as geography that require their faculty and graduate students uh, to provide short descriptions of the research projects that they're working on. Um, some researchers would like to raise their profile uh, in the media, especially. So their research sum summaries should probably be uh, a little bit more media friendly. Maybe they have a little bit more of a hook uh, we have reporters in this province that um, once a month go through um, go through uh, Yafo some uh, through Yafo search engine uh, specifically to um, look for interesting stories. Uh, I'm just going to stop this for a second and see the comment. Unfortunately. Ah, excellent. UBC now requires lay summaries for every thesis. Um, yeah, that's not necessarily over, always the case with um, all of the universities. Um, sometimes they uh, want to make research available to potential users as, um, as sort of a give back to the community. 
Uh, and sometimes they're creating research summaries because they would, <coughs> sorry, What's um, because they would like to uh, find community and industry partners in order to expand the project they're working on. Uh, and I can talk about that brokering role that we play here at the Harrison. Uh, the other question we ask researchers and students to consider is who are you writing this for? Not just why, but who exactly are you writing this for? If you are writing your research summary for knowledge brokers, such as my colleague Amy um, Jones here in the office and me, um, we get to see every research summary that comes through YAFL, and we get to see every opportunity that comes through YAFL. If your research summary is clear, concise, well written and brings all the salient points forward. When I have somebody who is looking for a researcher to help them address a need in their community, I am more likely to use you as a potential researcher if I understand the kind of work you do. Uh, our communications advisors here at Memorial University always look at YAFO and always look at research summaries uh, in order to be able to promote their departments and faculties and the research that's going on there. Uh, as it said, media uses research summaries to fish for good stories. Um, potential partners um, may be interested in the kind of research that, research that you do as a researcher or a graduate student, uh, because you might be providing a part of a solution to something that they're dealing with. And one unintended consequence of YAFO has been that Grad, potential graduate students would go through YAFO, look at faculty profiles and projects and project summaries, and um, contact them in order to uh, find a supervisor and potentially become a graduate student here at Memorial. Uh, we have, in the second version of YAFO that I just showed you uh, briefly, we actually made that explicit. So when you go to that menu, is, um, you say, where you go in, where it says, I want to, you can say, I want to find a supervisor. So we allow faculty now to indicate that A, they're available for supervision and students can actually connect with the faculty specifically for that purpose. Um, the other reason why you would do a research summary is because you want your colleagues to know what it is that you're doing. We tend to tell researchers that YAFO is not necessarily the best place to do that you're probably connected to your colleagues through a whole bunch of other um, media, networks. Uh, you may be co-editing journals together. You may be co-publishing. Um, is, these are very much lay summaries. Uh, so communicating with your colleagues, this might be a great starting point. But to really get into the nuances of research, there are probably better avenues to do. And we always provide some helpful hints to researchers. The one that we found the most useful is we tell them not to defend their research. By the time when a potential graduate student, media, community partners, industry partners, when they look at your research summary of your research, they already trust researcher that they've done everything the way it's supposed to be done. There is no need to defend your research in your research summary. Focus on results or anticipated results if this is an ongoing project and tell people why is your project important, who is it, uh, whom is it important to, how are you going to go about um, doing it, where is it going to take place, and how can people help use this. Uh, what I love about research snapshots is that it, provide you, it provides you with a limited number of words for each of these sections, essentially. And I'm, I'm thinking, I am very close to the point where I would like to start demanding that of people who are creating Yahoo profiles, uh, because we limited, the, we limited the word count, uh, but they're still too long and a little bit too rambling. I think we are ready to kind of um, shrink that a little bit. And maybe the last little bit I want to tell you about, and Michael, feel free to jump in here. Okay. It's a little exercise that we did this morning. We've never done this before. This is the first time we did this with graduate students. Um, here at the, uh, here at the um, Hair Center, uh, I produce, with the help of my uh, colleague, Rebecca Koho, a podcast called Rural Roots. That's uh, Rural, R-O-U-T-E-S, if you want to... Uh, check it out. You can find us on iTunes, but you can any other podcasting app, or you can just go to the website ruralrootspodcasts.com. 
Anyway, we recently did an episode about um, um, community researcher collaborations and how they change both. And one of the people we interviewed for that episode was the um, chief executive officer of Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador, the municipal association here in the province. And he said that one of the best, he, he worked with a team of researcher, researchers on uh, drinking water issues in um, remote and rural communities, which is about 75% of the province um, here. And he said one of the best things that uh, ever happened during that two year research project was that somewhere midway, the researchers would, were able to give them five things that they could do as a small municipality right away to improve their water quality. And then uh, after that, they built certain policy papers and positions and advocacy um, papers that all came out of this research. But to be able to say to municipalities who work with the research team, hey, you've been working with these guys for eight months. Here is five things that you can do as a result of this research that will improve your water quality was invaluable. Um, so Rebecca and I were joking on air that this is like clickbait research, you know. And uh, so this, this today, we said, well, why don't we ask students to do just that? So we asked them to think about the research that they're doing as part of the graduate program in terms of clickbait. The researchers looked at X and you won't believe what they found. Or, you know, five things about X that will blow your mind. And the students did blow our minds. It was fantastic. Uh, we had a researcher who is um, studying um, how people construct alibis uh, in order to uh, present themselves in the court um, after a criminal offense happened. Uh, so he came up with, uh, want to get away with murder? Here is five things your alibi needs to have. <laughs> uh, we had a researcher who was uh, doing very technical biology research on a particular enzyme but was able that lives in lamprey fish but she was able to construct this incredible story of, you know, ugly fish that holds a secret you wouldn't believe. And um, she told us a whole story that was, it was so good, I could have put that on air that moment. Oh, it was, it was incredibly compelling. <laughs> and it, I mean, to me, the, the context around this is understanding your audience. We created the safe space for them to really kind of work amongst themselves, but present their research in a way that lacks a lot of that academic formality. And they took to it right away. There was a third researcher who studies princesses. And she comes at it. It's like, here's the top five badass princesses that you'll ever see on film. Yeah, it, it was really interesting. So we told them, you know, it's a great exercise at the beginning of writing your research summary because it gets you to have that. It gets you to think about what is the essence of your research. Now, you're probably writing for an audience that would not appreciate reading that. But it gives you a start and you can then build on it. So I'm going to, here's my contact information. You should always feel free to uh, get in touch if you have any questions. I am going to close the presentation, but Michael and I will stay here for sure and yeah. answer as many questions as we can. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and in closing, um, a couple things I want to share. Uh, our work in clear language communications has started to extend beyond just the snapshot. Understand it's our primary product, but we have a, a design communication student who's starting to work with us and our researchers around the preparation of infographics. Again, it's, it's all audience specific and it's different ways to convey research findings. It's, very, it's in the very early stages, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to develop some process documents similar to what we've done around snapshots that we can share across the network because it's, uh, again, it, it boils down to how folks like to access information. Uh, and it's interesting, the use of infographics is really interesting because for the for three years now, four years maybe, uh, we had a partnership with the Community Foundation of uh, Newfoundland and we produce uh, vital signs. Uh, Vital Science are a statistical annual um, showing the um, certain aspects of um, Newfoundland and Labrador um, through statistics and infographics. And it's essentially, these are all researchers working um, at Memorial University. I'm going to paste a link directly to the PDF of this year's Vital Science. 
and we use designers and writers to help translate that into very visual summaries of the research. And, and I'll be curious to know in, in the future whether or not any of our colleagues across the Research Impact Canada network are involved in this within Canada. I mean, the Community Foundations Canada, they really drive and initiate mm -hmm. this process. We've worked closely in York Region, just north of Toronto, and the Community Foundation there was, was fledgling for quite a while. It was almost half time. I believe it's closed now. But we supported uh, one of the releases a, a number of years ago, but they simply didn't have the capacity to sustain it. If there are others who are involved in this effort, that might be a worthwhile conversation as well, because having looked through the one that uh, the Harris Center and, and Boyan's office here at Help Support, they've done some fantastic work. I mean, engaging with researchers across campus, but really, and in the spirit of this webinar, how to convey data and information and research findings in a clear and concise way. Questions? Any questions or, or comments? And while folks are, are typing away, I'll put in a little plug for the Research Impact Canada Network. This is our first webinar. As mentioned, we are going to be rolling out other webinars in, in 2018. The Professional Development Committee is, is going to be meeting hopefully before the end of the calendar year. And we'll have an opportunity to kind of um, roll out some um, future webinars and we'll try to attach dates with them, but safe to say we'll do our best to, to make everyone who's connected today aware of these moving forward. Are we offline? Can people still hear us? Yeah. Oh, there's a question. Uh, Krista asked, do you ask the five amazing things before the clear language writing or do you do the writing then get the five amazing things from the summaries? Um, I wish I could say, but this is the first time we did it. I think it works better if you ask it first. It's kind of a non-threatening fun exercise that gets them in the right frame of mind to actually think about their research a little bit differently. Uh, it worked miraculously. I had no idea if it's going to work or not, but they were so into it. It was amazing. I think the great thing about it, it really, it kind of recal re recalibrated their thinking around how they communicate their research. I think it could work the same with faculty. In fact, we talked about this on the walk over here to the Harris Center. I think it could work really well. I think there are a number of faculty who, who could do this extremely well. Um, so I, I, was, I was very encouraged and I was just blown away with, with what I saw this morning. And I, I'm just very cautious. I do not at any point advocate that research should be presented as clickbait stories, but as an exercise to get you to think of your research and what's really important, uh, I think it's really a fun way to do that. Yeah, definitely. Next question from Isabella, hoping to be able to have a list of these webinars, would like to be able to invite other research facilitators, and that's fantastic. Is there an idea of where you're thinking of posting or distributing? Um, <laughs> okay, so Isabella, within the, within the Research Impact Canada network, we've, we've got a list of, of primary contacts. These would be brokers or research facilitators who regularly liaise within our network. And we would let them know explicitly that they're welcome to share these across campus with uh, faculty, graduate students, and other staff as appropriate. Uh, so hopefully we'll get a chance to see you at some of the future uh, webinars. Oh, there we go. Yes, we, we will be um, promoting these uh, on Twitter at Research Impact, so that will be a, a good way if anybody is not following Research Impact, that would be good. And we are also recording this um, webinar and we'll record all the future ones, um, so we'll post, we'll eventually be able to post them on our website, um, so you'll be able to see. Mm -hmm. And that was Krista pointing out that uh, we are going to have a new website and a LinkedIn group. Wayne. 
do you see an actual audience for a variation of that type, type clickbait of communication? Not clickbait, but much more entertaining style of sharing evidence. Yes, and I don't know if I say that yes with trepidation yeah. or yes enthusiastically. I'm not quite uh, quite sure how I feel about it one way or the other. Um, interestingly enough, I was talking with a couple of colleagues here in the office, and we were thinking that this we have this event we organize called Unbuttoned, which is Memorial Unbuttoned, uh, where we take researchers and grad students and we take them off the campus um, somewhere downtown usually, and we um, create unusual and interesting ways to present research. And we were thinking, what if we had an evening of clickbait stories? You know, I think in certain, in certain contexts, it would be a really fun thing to do. Uh, I would be very hesitant to advocate clickbait as the clickbait format as a way to present research. Yeah, yeah. I think that the context around this is, is significant. It was really a pilot within a safe room where it was just students and ourselves. But it, it did give sort of pause for reflection in terms of, firstly, their, their interest and ability to convey things that way. And if appropriate, depending on the audience, if, especially if it's really just education and awareness versus that significant and substantive policy change. It, uh, is there's a light nature to it. And when it, Wayne, I think you're right. I think... Um, uh, we could, it does speak to the change in nature of how we consume content. And I can totally see it working um, on social media, as long as I think we would have to be very responsible as research communicators and knowledge mobilizers to make sure that, you know, that clickbait links to really valuable deep content um, and doesn't become yet another cat video. Yes, yes. <laughs> So we had a question about where can people get training in clear language writing? Uh, and there are many answers around that. Uh, like I mentioned briefly, we work with an adult educator who's developed some expertise in this. He's done a number, uh, he's delivered a number of sessions for us at York University and with a number of our stakeholders. There is a fee for service component to that. However, through our collaboration, we have access to the baseline uh, training information, and we could certainly share that. So, like a lot of things, there's a Cadillac version to this. I mean, the most substantive session he's done is close to three-quarter day uh, hands-on uh, within uh, an organization to a 45-minute lunch and learn where you write a little 50-word what you need to know. And we can offer everything in between. This is This is certainly something that the professional development committee within research impact Canada is going to start to explore. I think not only around training in this, but maybe some of the other things that we roll out in terms of where can people go for more information. Um, so safe to say that we can provide more uh, substantive information in the future, but if people are looking for something in the short term, they're welcome to, to contact me. And I believe that my contact information was the, at the end of my presentation. Okay. So, so while uh, Boyan was, was presenting, I've, and it, it's not that I have an addiction to my smartphone, okay, people? So let's not be judging. <laughs> no, I was uh, active on Twitter. I actually tweeted a picture of, of Boyan while he was presenting. I, oh. did, I did that. Uh, and I want to acknowledge there have been a, a fairly large number of folks who have been participating today that have been tweeting uh, about this session. So thank you very much. Uh, I know that with across the Research Impact Canada network, there are a number of us who are quite active on Twitter and it's a great way to share and exchange and promote uh, the work we're doing. So for those that have been tweeting and, and showing support, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. And I just saw um, a previous question about um, how, is it, um, Anik asks, is it possible to get our PowerPoint presentation to share them? Sure, no problem. Yeah. Um, not sure how we make them widely available, but we can. We probably have all of your emails if you're registered. Um, these are small presentations. We can probably just... Yeah, exactly. I can. Yeah. Um, Michael? 
Yeah, I was going to add that uh, for those of who have registered, um, we can send you uh, a PDF of the presentation because we do have your emails and uh, we can follow up with that. Okay, that's one hour. Thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to get back to is uh, somebody asked how has uh, Research Snapshot, Marcelo, been received within the internal academic community? Um, I find that the whole notion of clear writing and research summaries um, it's all and knowledge mobilization in general uh, we have always made it clear that you can do this you can take this as far as you feel comfortable as a researcher this is still very much an optional nice to do thing for most researchers because they are very much focused on research and uh, teaching uh, we have champions here at MUN who are excellent at it we have people who are probably never going to create a YAFO pro profile, never create a research summary, and quite frankly, don't want to connect to anybody outside of a small group of people who study the same thing they do. And you know what? That's okay. Um, some research requires a very different kind of dissemination and connection to the outside world than the kind of stuff that we do, um, and that's okay. We just like to be able to, for the, all of the, those who are keen to engage on this level, uh, we are always happy to help. All righty. Matthew, YAFO seems like a shop window to connect researchers and stakeholders. Do knowledge brokers have a different type of profile on YAFO? Yes. I am not showing you my profile when I log in because it's kind of scary. There is all sorts of dashboards and uh, I can actually match people through YAFO um, and um, I get to see a whole bunch of additional information. So yes, it looks a little bit different for me than it would uh, for a regular user. Well, and I'll take it a step further because I've had a chance to work closely with Boyan over a number of years, especially in the early days when when YAFL was being developed. And safe to say, I think it would be its own webinar, mm -hmm. which would allow uh, you and your team to kind of go through and unpack its utility, the vision, uh, because I think there's some really strong engagement opportunities. And, and now that it's really live and functioning, you can see how robust it is. Yeah. And we just on Friday, we launched uh, networks um, capability publicly. Yeah. Um, so now you can create networks of researchers. Um, that essentially came out of um, things like uh, Rural Policy Learning Commons, uh, Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation Network. Um, these are large partnerships that work on multiple projects, um, but are also very much connected as a network. And we realized that that was a functionality that wasn't quite there. So it was relatively easy to implement. Um, so we did well, we talked earlier about the fact that your, your end users as well will help to, to drive the product. But a question about uh, being able to post the slides on the KMB York SlideShare site. Yes, we will certainly uh, share them there. And that is a, another point of access and engagement. The good thing about SlideShare, it allows you to track uh, some pretty good analytics. I know Krista Jensen, our Knowledge Mobilization Officer at York, has, has put a number of our presentations up there in the past. And it's really interesting to see the growing number of, of users that want access to that information. And David is wondering if any of our Francophone colleagues have written uh, Flash Recherche. Uh, you will folks have to type that into chat window. So yes. let us know, have you yeah. done any? <laughs> and and while, um, while they're um, typing about that, I mean, our, the network is, is bilingual. I mean, we and, and it will be certainly uh, well reflected as, as the, the new website is developed, but tools like the Research Snapshot were certainly developed um, with a Francophone interface as well. So for Aubert and Anik, and if there's anybody else on the line who's interested in exploring this further, similar to that uh, toolkit page that I shared, we have the, uh, some of the resources and infrastructure in, in French as well. Uh, we have about 12 minutes left, and uh, I was wondering if I may be able to ask you guys a question. 
Uh, what kind of webinars would you like to see in the future? Yeah, we are in a, in a planning mode. Yeah, the professional development committee is in its planning stage and we are actually going to have a PD committee at a bar downtown. I'm not shy to say that. We are, we're going to go downtown and have a serious discussion about professional development. But we are interested in the things that you're looking for. I mean, making this uh, useful for yourself is going to be really helpful. Uh, one of the ideas that I think would be interesting is um, just because it's uh, a lot on my mind these days as we are producing the second season of our podcast is the storytelling for research um, seems to be something that we have um, kind of struggled a little bit with. Um, we spend a fair bit of time coaching some of the researchers we talk to um, because the natural tendency is to defend your research. And um, we are hoping that we can get them a little bit past that and get them to tell us a story. And contrary to popular belief, um, the researcher, people are not just interested about your research, they're also interested in you as a researcher. Um, so when we do a podcast, we often do ask a little bit more personal questions, not very personal questions, but things like, you know, what made you look into this? Because there's so many things you could be researching. But why this? Clearly, it's your passion. And when you, and kind of maybe we can have a little webinar around how we can help researchers relax a little bit and be passionate about what they do, because most of the time they really are. Cynthia, that's fantastic. Yes, social media as a KMB tool. Would love to do that. So I've got that written down, actually. And, and I mean, I, I actually think that will be very dynamic. There are a number within our national network that, that have acquired some expertise on that through experience. So to have a, a series of presenters talking about their work in good practice would be excellent. Well, Marcelo has just filled up our inbox. This is <laughs> excellent. Thank you. Yaffle for knowledge mobilization brokers. Yeah, I agree, Marcelo. I, I think it is a dedicated hour just to, to learn more, but really filter it through a brokering lens. Social network analysis, that is interesting. I don't know if I've heard that before, but that would be uh, worth exploring. Open source and creative commons, very uh, high utility there. Infographics 101, wow, you guys are, you, awesome. guys are, you guys are on fire. This is good. <laughs> are you writing this down? I am. Okay. Uh, writing knowledge mobilization plans, I think that'd be a great one, Cynthia. Um, several members of the Research Impact Canada do have templates, and no, we do, uh, for knowledge mobilization plans and guides on how to write them. Uh, I think that would make for a really interesting session to kind of share some of those documents. Uh, knowledge mobilization with Indigenous communities. Thank you, Isabella. Um, that's a great question. We um, are certainly learning a lot here in... Uh, uh, here in Newfoundland Labrador, um, we are building some new relationships, figuring out how to work with indigenous communities in our province. Um, we have recently published uh, an actual um, podcast episode about uh, research ethics in uh, indigenous communities, um, and that looked at the development of very specific um, knowledge mobilization plans and uh, and uh, ethics protocols. Uh, actually, uh, while Michael answers some of these questions, I will uh, happily post direct link to um, that episode. Uh, would you like to? Certainly, moving on to, uh, so Matthew is asking about, or sharing, teaching professors about the needs, expectations, and cultures of external stakeholders. And what I like about that, Matthew, it, it, it would allow us to market to a really unique audience. Marketing, our network and the work we do directly to uh, a researcher audience could be really valuable. So I've got that noted, thank you. And over at York, uh, Nello asked for a session on video, presumably as a tool to support and enable knowledge mobilization. I, yeah, I really think that kind of aligns with some of the other things we've talked about as, as ways to convey research, but a dedicated session on that is uh, entirely possible. Um, 
I am po Isabella. I'm posting a posting a direct link to to that episode. Uh, there's also a short video that um, Rebecca Coho, uh, who hosts and produces with me, uh, produced as part of her job as a communications person for Office of Public Engagement uh, when that project uh, won President's Award for Public Engagement. Um, I mean, going back to Matthew's comment, I think it would be entirely possible for us to engage some of these external stakeholders that you're speaking with that are familiar with our work and the processes in which we do this to share their experience. I mean, it would be easy for people like Boyan and I and probably others uh, on the other side of the microphone that have experience, but getting that voice in and kind of letting us know that, all right, here's what works for us. Here's what we need. Maybe he, to be quite blunt, here's what you do well and, and here's what... Here's more that we could need uh, learn from you. I like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry to be uh, so blunt promoting rural roots here, but um, this episode might also be of interest um, to you, Matthew, because it deals specifically with uh, a relationship between researchers and uh, small communities. So it's not necessarily industry, but it's um, communities and municipal governments. Well, and I think for all of us out there, um, I mean, Research Impact Canada operates as a community of practice. We want to be able to create mechanisms that we can really effectively share information easily. I mean, I've been really impressed with today the quality and the quantity of the questions and, and the exchange. We're really going to look at exploring ways that we can keep this energy beyond something like today because we, we all are part of the knowledge mobilization ecosystem and, and have important contributions to make. Yeah. You are certainly welcome, Matthew. And uh, I think the system will kick us off in <laughs> five minutes, right, Michael? Um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so if we, this, we can probably take another question or two, but uh, if suddenly the screen goes dark, it's because the system closed. And of course, um, all those that have registered with your emails, um, we'll give you information, uh, Boyan's and Michael's uh, emails, so that if there's any other questions that you think about in the next uh, couple days, um, after some reflection, uh, we'll uh, give you that ability to contact them further. Absolutely. Terrific. Well, regardless of whether or not there's another question coming in, I want to thank everybody for your time. Uh, it's, it's been really enjoyable to, to connect up with you all across the country and, and over in the UK. Uh, thanks, Boyan, for, for hosting, and we're looking forward to doing more of these. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This was really fun. I'm always skeptical how is this going to work, and then it always <laughs> works way better than I expected. <laughs> thanks, Bonnie. You're more than welcome, Bonnie. And I'm glad your uh, KM and the AM in Saskatchewan went well. Thank you, Lisa. So now we need to create outro music. We need something. Really oh, good. yeah, we totally do. Yeah, we, need to, we need to do that. <laughs> okay, that's for the next webinar. That's right. That's for the next webinar. We'll have intro and outro music. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's sort of interesting on that. On that topic, um, Doug Ramsey at Brandon University um, did a, it was in our music faculty and it was two entertainers and it was kind of like a storytelling, rural storytelling along with music as well. Ooh, nice. and, then, and then each each music piece had a, a story behind it like, and it was very rural related. One of them was on uh, changing industry in, in, in small communities. And, um, but the link between the music and the, the rural story was really well done. I, I told Doug after that I wish it was recorded because it was so good, it was <laughs> entertaining, but also helped convey some of those rural issues that uh, people are, are experiencing across country. And because they travel throughout North America, um, the stories were broad as well. So it gave kind of a really interesting picture of uh, some different rural communities in North America. That's cool. So we, we only have a minute or so left. I'm going to, this is uh, Newfoundland folk music, uh, the once. So we'll have them sing us out.
I sound like, I sound like a radio host now. Oh, there I'm you totally go. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. You're welcome, Marcel. <laughs> Down.